God had to take me to a place where effectively I was absolutely at the bottom of the pit and my uh, kidney function was at uh, three. Transplantation was the best option for me. This is your ultimatum, Toby. Either you come back to me and I give you the ministry that I always had intended for you, or I take you home. We're here today in the beautiful Peak District. And we've come especially to meet a very interesting gentleman we want to introduce you to Toby Gadam. Hello. We want to talk today about your story and uh, what's going on in your life. You have a family business, haven't you? Can we start there? Uh, absolutely, yes. So the family business uh, is uh, as silk merchants, buying silk effectively from the Far East and then importing it to the UK and Europe. And that business started in the UK in 1875. Uh, in Manchester, uh, it subsequently moved to Macclesfield, and then latterly, uh, in 2008, it came here to uh, where we are in Leek. We make uh, our own brand. My grand, my great grandfather is Harry Gadams. We have made some shirts, uh, some waistcoats, and, and a tweed range that we can sell at various fairs. The spun silk comes as the derivative of continuous uh, silk, which of course comes from the cocoon. So here you've got various different thicknesses of yarn that can be used for all kinds of application. But what is really nice, actually, something like the fibre of silk, is it's, it feels like it's always going to be there. People love wearing silk and the byproducts of silk are so useful, actually, in medical and cosmetic and lots of other industries. And is it a Christian family that you come from? I would say that we come from a church family. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would think that there are Christians and have been Christians who have a faith in Jesus Christ throughout our time. But of course, as we know, going to church and being a Christian don't always tend to be the same thing. Absolutely. So how did you come to faith in Jesus? So um, my, my parents uh, are, are Christians, actually, mm. and uh, I was born into the Christian uh, family. And we always went to church every Sunday and grew up in Sunday school. My parents sent me away to boarding school along with my two younger brothers, Giles and Benedict. There was a strong Christian group at rugby and I was introduced to that by a friend. I didn't really engage in the Christian activities uh, there, but I introduced both my brothers to it. And then in 1990, both my brothers went up to the island of Mull, where the master that looked after this Christian group had effectively a retreat. And they went up there and they did jobs on uh, this property mm. and shared fellowship and um, were involved very much in a Christian life. And before they went, I, at that point, I was a non Christian and I became quite aggressive, I suppose, towards them. and said to them, well, you know, I don't know why you're wasting your time doing this. Anyway, they went off and they went off for about two or three weeks. When they came back, there was definitely something different about them. And they had become Christians well before this point. Mm. But I was uh, continued my aggression. My middle brother Giles just sat me down and I suppose gave the gospel to me in no uncertain terms with both barrels. And sometimes I think that message needs to come across, especially if you're faced with aggression. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that he was aggressive back, but, you know, he said in no uncertain terms where I would be going if I did not turn to Jesus Christ. Mm. And that message absorbed in my spirit and my soul. And uh, that this was in the August. And then in the September, we went back to school and it was my final year at rugby and at that point 
I walked past this master's house and saw him in his living room and I just went in through his front door and said, what do I need to do to become a Christian? That must have been very thrilling for him. <laughs> I think so, yes. I so don't know. how old were you at that, that stage? I was 18. Yes. Yeah. The difference that was from that light bulb moment of actually committing your life to Jesus. Yes. I would say, does it make everything that happened before irrelevant? Definitely not, because the seeds was, were certainly sown. But it's just such a profound change when you give your life to the Lord. Yes. Wonderful. So have you continued in that all your life? I have, yes. I, 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 my faith uh, has been there right from that moment mm. uh, to today. But it has been an up and down journey, as it is for an awful lot of Christians, of course. Of course, yes. Now you've been involved with the army, you're in the army, aren't you? And Just tell us about that. Well, I'm an army reservist, and um, as opposed to being a, a regular. And I joined the army reserves, which was uh, it, it back in 2001, mm -hmm. uh, which in those days was called the Territorial Army. And I suppose the reason that I did was uh, 10 years before that, I'd been playing club rugby, thoroughly enjoyed it through the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the point we, that rugby went from very much an amateur game to a professional game. Um, I'm not the biggest person out there and suddenly I was having been surrounded by chaps of, of a light, like to like size and, and, and really enjoying the game. Suddenly uh, these guys were getting bigger and bigger and, yes. uh, and I wasn't. <laughs> so at the age of 29 uh, I realised that really you know to be playing Rugby, you know, you, you had to, to, to really be commit to it. And I suppose, really, mm. you know, it's, it's a, very much a young person's sport. Uh, so at that point, I enjoyed the out, outdoors. I wanted, to, I wanted to be active. And mm. it was a friend of mine that said, well, why don't you join the Territorial Army? Yes. Yeah, so was it easy to be a Christian in the Army? I think in this day and age, it, it is easy. I mean, you know, society has... has become much more accepting of, of mm. lots of different faiths and, and, and how people live their lives. Mm. So I think for me, being a Christian in the army reserves is, is easy. And I say that because at the time, through, through the early 2000s, we were obviously on operations in Iraq and then subsequently Afghanistan. And people joined up, the army and the army reserves, wanting to do their bit yes. for the country. Mm. And so when people are put in a position where their lives are potentially are going to be in danger, it's really interesting to see how their psyche changes. Mm. And I suppose being a Christian, for me that was relatively easy because you could talk to people about what it's like to be a Christian and going into an area in the world where your life was in danger. Yes. So in talking to you, you've told us about your bulb or your light going dim. What happened to you there? As I say, I became, gave my life to the Lord uh, aged 18 uh, and left school. And uh, I then took a gap year in New Zealand and sort of fell in love with uh, the countryside and farming mm. and horses. And I suppose through my 20s, I, I was uh, very involved in the family business. I didn't go to university. I just went straight uh, from mm. having a gap year into uh, the family business yeah. and was very committed to a church in Macclesfield, St. Michael and All Angels. Uh, I was involved in home group and, and the Alpha course and uh, youth work uh, within the church. And for me, you know, God was central in my life and, and, and blessed me massively day to day with what I did. I played rugby. Um, at that point, uh, I was playing rugby in the winter. And because of my love of horses uh, from New Zealand, I was fortunate enough to get into carriage driving. And I bought a horse uh, from a friend of mine and started driving singly. And, uh, and then another friend uh, sold me uh, three horses. So I... I, I lived a full-on life, uh, both in, in the secular world and in, in the Christian world, with God central and, and blessing me through it. And that was mm. right through my 20s. And I suppose when things are going so well, it's so easy 
to become complacent. And that's basically that's the trap that I, I fell mm. into. And the enemy has his ways of uh, taking our eyes off God and, and, and it worked with me. And, and you know, I was, I was fit uh, and enjoying life and everything was going well. And I fell into the complacent box. And the further I fell into it, the more my focus on God reduced and diminished. And so the analogy of the cloud between myself and God, which was totally of my own doing, uh, got blacker and blacker and blacker. Mm. And even though I was still going to church, you know, that, that didn't make any difference because I suppose I was blinded to the word and blinded to what was being taught at church. And my, by, my personal time, you know, soon went from every day to every other day to every fourth day to once a week to once a month to as I as I saw fit really so mm. I had gone back from giving my life to God and allowing God to be in control of my life to me saying no I'm going to take control of my life because I feel good and I feel strong and I'm embarrassed to say that that really lasted for the next two decades. I, I met Jane and, and uh, we married and moved to uh, this home here in the Peak District. And I, can, I, I continued my army career and filled my life with lots of busy, busy things. Mm. And God was, was absolutely swept onto the carpet. I'm just amazed at his patience over 20 years he is so patient and he is so kind, isn't he? So how did you come to have your light brightened again? You know, it, it was God, you know, at, at the end of the day. And God uses many different ways, because we're all individuals, uh, yes. to, to, to bring us back into the fold and, and, and under his wings. Mm. And for me, um, it was actually through, through my health or deterioration in my health that, that, that he used. And in 2009, um, I had taken command of a, what we call a subunit. So a, basically a squadron or a company uh, of soldiers, about 100, 110 uh, people. And almost as I took that responsibility, um, things started to change. So the army have a system of reviewing your medical status pretty regularly and I had a medical and during the medical uh, the GP uh, noticed that my blood pressure was slightly on the high side and I had some blood in my urine and he pulled me to one side and said uh, it may be something or nothing but you may want to get this checked out hmm. so I then followed that procedure and after a few tests uh, my blood pressure started to increase and throughout the next couple of years, I was then diagnosed with something called IgA nephropathy, which is an autoimmune disease. And effectively, your antibodies then identify your kidneys uh, as enemy and oh. start to attack your kidneys. And over a period of time, uh, and it's dependent on that individual how long that process takes, yes. your kidneys start to deteriorate. So my focus was then on my health not on God. <laughs> and I, I, I then came under blood pressure medication because my blood pressure had skyrocketed. And it won, at, at some point, it was uh, 220 over 160, which wow. is uh, pretty high. Very. Uh, I'm not surprised uh, and very blessed that I hadn't burst at that point. In 2011, I had a biopsy. I felt well enough, mm. uh, but I got on with life and put it to the back of your mind as you do, and you think, well, actually, you know, I feel okay, there's something wrong. But you know what, it doesn't matter because, you know, I've got years of active activity left. At that point in my Christian walk, you know, I still went to church uh, here in, in, in the village and did my duty, so to speak. Um, and it wasn't until um, my army career developed and I was fortunate enough blessed in, in, my, in my case to uh, be offered the job as commanding officer of an organization called Scottish North Irish Yeomanry. 
So my butler is wearing the officer's mess uniform of the Scottish and North Irish Yeomanry. It's rather fun. <laughs> and at that point, my symptoms really started, of, of kidney failure, really started to uh, show themselves. Mm. And I suppose a healthy human being would have a, a kidney function of, they, they use the term EGFR in the medical world, uh, of, you know, 80 plus, 90 plus. And uh, in my case, this was, I was probably getting round about the sort of 20 to 30 mark in that case. And normally they say that, you know, at that point you'd be looking at um, a kidney transplant from a, a donor, either live or deceased, uh, or certainly starting to look at dialysis. Mm. I'd swept God under the carpet. So I, I, I effectively went through this on my own. Of course, I didn't, because if you know the, foot, the, 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 poem, the story of the footprints in the sand, of course. at this point yeah. in my life, there's only one set of footprints. <laughs> God had to take me to a place where effectively I was absolutely at the bottom of the pit uh, in terms of my health for me to realise that actually, you know, I knew the Christian faith. I counted myself as a Christian. I believed in God. I believe in Jesus, mm. but I didn't actively put God first in my life. Uh, the army's very keen on fitness. Yes. And uh, my body deteriorated so much so that my legs could barely move. I could hardly run. As an army reservist in our unit, we have to do six miles with weight on our on our backs. Yes. And that was uh, now in January 2018. And at that point, I knew that if I did this activity, I would wouldn't even make the first mile out of six miles. Yeah. I would collapse. Now, whether the Lord would take me at that point, I don't know. But I, I at least I had the now, so, or God had told me, don't do this. This is this is this is your moment. So I wouldn't say necessarily the light bulb moment, you know, was instant and it switched on like that. But that was a significant, January 2018 was, was a significant yes. moment. I mean, you've got to be fighting fit, haven't you, to be literally in yeah. the army. You know, if I'm brutally honest, uh, you know, the army is an organisation where it needs its people to be fit and strong. Absolutely. For anything, you yeah. know, to defend the realm. Yes. And at this point, I certainly wasn't fit and I certainly wasn't strong. And really, my use to the army would be null and void. The army could ask me to hand my uniform in and, and I would be medically discharged. And I was yes. concerned about that. And that's mm. the human pride element in me. I was referred back from the Manchester Royal to um, University Hospitals, North Midlands in Stoke, where who have a really good renal unit. And they got hold of my notes and they phoned, the phone call came through and said, uh, Mr. Gadam, I think you better come in rather quickly. You're not very well. So at that point, I came. I went in to, to see them, thinking I'd have a five or ten minute consultation as I'd previously done over the last decade, effectively. Yeah. And at that point, my I had a blood test, and my uh, kidney function was at uh, three. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so really, not very clever, and probably weeks away from from death. Um, so my. My thoughts of a 10 minute consultation turned into three hours where yes. I was wheeled into uh, the, the transplant clinic. I was wheeled into dialysis. I was almost put on the spot and said, well, what dialysis do you want? Do you want hemodialysis, which is, you know, where blood's cleaned and put back in you? Or do you want peritoneal dialysis? And so lots of decisions had to, you know, go be made yeah. sort of very quickly. So it was just a whirl of... Uh, of what to do and it's still at this point I, I still wasn't praying or putting God first because on the human element it was just a whirlwind of, of, yes, of, of yes. life disruption and I was trundling from Leek up to Scotland uh, to do my army reservist job you know which was two or three days a week and uh, taking my dialysis kit with me and dialyzing through the night etc you know at that point having spoken to my family uh, my light bulb that had been at 80 watts through my 20s and had dimmed down to 20 watts, 
you know, over the last couple of decades were starting to flicker and starting to, to brighten again. Yeah. And I suppose the other significant moment was when um, transplantation was the best option for me yes. uh, because of my IJ anthropathy. And really, ideally, a closest live match was the one that would really give me longevity of life uh, as opposed to a deceased uh, donor. So my family rallied round and, and went forward for blood tests. And it so happened through the Lord's blessing that I had an identical match with my youngest brother, Ben. Oh, it was, it was amazing. Um, we were all in a room together and the nurse shared because we'd all had compatibility checks. And um, we were, um, she shared, shared the results at the same time. And to, to, to find out that I was a perfect match was amazing because this was going to be the opportunity for, for Toby to have a, a chance of getting better. Um, and she said it was like him winning the lottery. I suppose that was the next significant moment in terms of God effectively saying to me through this process, you know, you've committed your life to me. You have grown with me. You have turned your back on me. And I, this is your ultimatum, Toby. Either you come back to me and I give you the ministry that I always had intended for you, or I take you home. And I'll take you home and you will be with me in heaven. But will you really have fulfilled what I wanted you to fulfill on earth? So, of course, when you're given that ultimatum, there's no choice. Yeah. So the light bulb quickly went to 40 watts, 60 <laughs> watts. And I just praise God. Yes. But, you know, God has, you know, we're all individuals. We all, you know, we, we, we are individual in our faith. Mm. And God has to do different things if we go off piste yes. to bring us back in line. Yes. And that's my story story in terms yes. of up to that point of Lovely. what he had to do for me and it's a huge lesson I think certainly for me but maybe for others too. Mm. You obviously went through with the operation. And I think for Ben um, it was you know a no-brainer in terms of a decision to help me. You know I gave him plenty of opportunity to say that you know you don't need to do this and he discussed it with his wife, Claire, and, mm. and his two children, and obviously prayed about it. The decision to, um, to give a kidney to Toby was uh, an absolute no-brainer. Um, and I believe that you know, God had fashioned my kidneys from when I was in my mother's womb um, to be a perfect match for, for, the, you know, for such a time as this. We've been quite close as, as brothers uh, and with my other brother Giles at the same time. But I suppose when you go through this kind of trauma, you can't help but become close. And I think mm. for me, right up to when we had the operation, the day that, that we went into hospital uh, before the operation the following day, I was very, very ill. I, I had finished my job in Scotland two weeks previously, and I suppose the adrenaline had stopped flowing from my yes. body, and I, yeah. I just plummeted and was really, really poorly. You know, Ben was always positive. Uh, we were in different wards and he came round uh, to see me and we prayed together the night before the operation. Mm. And the operation was, was, was uh, hugely blessed by God. God had, was very much in the hands of the surgeons uh, at that point. And in, in recovery, you know, both of us were, were sore. So the operation was fine. Um, there were a lot of people praying for us and which we really felt, and I particularly felt that on on the day of the operation, I felt a supernatural peace as I went down to the theatre and um, felt very comfortable that I was in God's hands and this was going to be an amazing thing for Toby. And I suppose our connection is deeper than it would be before because, you know, I have a part of his body sitting <laughs> just here uh, yeah. doing its thing uh, yeah. to, keep me, to keep me alive and well. So Toby, that's about a year ago now. So. What has God been doing in your life during this year and what do you see into the future? For me, the, on a spiritual level, my quiet time, the first thing I noticed was my quiet times came into being straight away. And, you know, I've not missed a quiet time, a daily quiet time 
since and that's been really encouraging for me mm. and you know my wife and I have sort of settled into a new church in the Diocese of Derby in uh, the next door town Nashbourne St Oswalds and we're very happy there. The Lord has blessed me in terms of being able to join a men's group and be involved in an online alpha course through the coronavirus uh, pandemic but I think more than anything else he has focus my mind on what is important and that is serving him yeah. for his glory uh, in the world and during the last during latterly the last 12 months uh, my wife and I have sold a, a chunk of our business we've retained our family business and and uh, the the tweed business by that happening it's given me more time to wait on God and and, and for him to use me in in in, in what ministry uh, he sees fit and I think it's just a question of being open to mm -hmm. God praying to him talking to him continually throughout each and every day not being distracted by the secularism that bombards our lives whether it's on television whether it's in adverts or whether it's just the complacency which is still hugely out there but just to focus on God and focus on his purpose. Mm. Because I know that, you know, not that I want to slip away from him again, but there won't be a second chance. So I need to serve him and be open to hear his voice, um, you know, from here until he eventually calls me home. And I hope that I can serve him and he can be proud of, of what I do for his glory. I think the best thing really has been to see how Toby's relationship with the Lord has moved on and not just moved on, it's rocketed on. And for this to, to be part of, of the results is, um, is truly wonderful. So Toby, would you like to pray for anyone who perhaps needs healing or who his, their light bulb has gone out, they've lost their uh, edge with the Lord? Father God, I thank you so much for your many blessings on all your people. I thank you for the journey that you take us through in our lives. I thank you for the good times and I thank you for the bad times. And I pray for all those that may be watching today, wherever they are in their own lives, whether they need healing, whether they need to be taken away from or brought out of complacency, whether they need their light bulb to shine brightly, whatever that reason, I pray, Lord, that you may touch their hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Toby, very much.